Hello again. Tonight we're going to talk about wavelength capture imaging. It's a strange set of three words, but uh, we'll get into the details of it. It's basically a new kind of camera. So it's a, it's a design concept for a new means of recording the wavelength of photons entering your sensor. Currently, we have ways of doing this. They're called cameras, and they have uh, you know pixels, and the pixels are covered by different color filters, and then they do post-processing called Bayer matrix, um, or they put glass filters on the front, and you get take an image in red, an image in green, an image in blue, image in brightness with no filter, and then in software, you smash it all together, and you get a picture. But that's a lot, and when they talk about you know single snapshot color, it's kind of a misnomer because they take one snapshot, but it's really red, green, blue, and brightness filtered, and then they post-process it. So this would actually be simpler, fewer components. It will be digitally accurate, not based upon uh, chemistry. So if, if you know your basic chemistry of uh, when I excite an electron, I can only excite it with a specific amount of energy, and it will move from one shell to another, and then when it drops back down, it'll spit out a photon. So the the uh, nanometers, the energy level of that photon, will be specific to the particular element, the orbital, and how far up it moves back and down. So it's not a continuous value. So there are actually gaps in images where you don't get all the colors as a continuous spectrum. They have places where, I'm sorry, uh, photon excitation just can't occur there because of the kind of material that's in the sensor. So this would be something that works over a continuous and wider range. It might even be able to take you from ultraviolet down through visual to infrared and maybe even microwave radio, all with the same sensor. When you talk about the photoelectric effect, it's when a photon hits the material and excites it to produce an electron, um, there are certain kinds of photons that slip through the gaps based upon the chemistry of whatever the sensor is, and it just can't record them. Now, if it's simpler, then it should be easier to produce lots of them and less expensive once it gets mass manufactured. At this point, it's a concept. It's, it's not finished goods, but when we get towards the very end of the presentation, you'll see that uh, I'm not the only one thinking about this. But since I don't have access to a semiconductor fabrication plant, uh, I'm not going to be building one soon. I'll leave that to others. Maybe they'll watch the video and learn something from it. So light. Light is photons. It's a quantity of photons. Each photon has a wavelength or a frequency or a color. Uh, and then the, if it's uh, photons, they exhibit a particle wave duality. And as a wave, the orientation of the wave, the phase of it can be different. Light has what is known as a radiative flux property. It's not just a particular kind of photon, it's how many of them are there in the beam of light. So it's the quantity of them per square area that's the flux. And you'll often see this listed as um, international standard units of measure called lumens or candela. And that's akin to the brightness, the radiative flux of something. But then there's another one you might see when you're buying like light bulbs, and it's the ANSI lumens. And that is the same as candela, but it's biased by the uh, ability of the human retina. Where is it most sensitive to what color? So it's it's got a peak at 555 nanometers, which is in the green range, which is why if you ever look at night vision goggles, the phosphor they chose to show the military uh, in total darkness is green, a bright green, because their eyes are going to pick that up better. So flux you'll usually see documented as a, a power over a square area per unit time or seconds. So you might see it as like watts per square meter per second or w.m superscript 2.sec. But it, it's literally how many photons are you throwing out of whatever you're emitting them from per second over an area. Now, I've often in the past mentioned the concept of metrology, 
metrology just means you have some way of digitally measuring something, quantifying it. Um, so, you know, we have the ability to do spectroscopy where we can take a broad spectrum of light in and we can pick out the rainbow using uh, uh, grating uh, or prisms to bend the light so we can break it into its component colors. And then we'll put sensors at the back end of the grating or the prism to capture the brightness on different color bands, but they're integral as in, you know, once you spread it out, um, if you use individual sensors, the sensors are not continuous. There's going to be sensor and then another sensor and then another sensor. And the sensors are not measuring color. They're measuring brightness at the particular angle of the sensors. So it will not only not get all the colors, there'll be gaps in whatever the colors are. And you have to design that for, for whatever bandwidth of colors you're going to be picking apart. You can also put a color one-shot camera at the receiving end of that uh, prism or um, grating and collect as many colors as you have pixels along that arc of where the rainbow shows up, and then as many colors as your one-shot camera can discern. And if you know your average HD grade video cameras, it's 16 million colors. That's it. That's that's all I've got because it's eight red, eight green, eight blue, and you mix them together, eight times three, 24, 24 bit color. So 16 million colors. So all the time we've been told it's in full color. No, it's in, as full of color as it does. It could do better, but they're never going to tell you that because why would you buy a camera that isn't perfect? Because uh, that's all we do right now. But if you go to buy a research grade instrument for spectroscopy, it's a see you coming kind of, you know, lab results price tag. So if you go buy yourself a piece of grading material, which you can buy on Amazon for under 10 bucks, and then you go buy yourself a HD grade color camera for 20 bucks, and it plugs into USB, you can now see the rainbow and you can pick apart the colors for you know, easily under 50 bucks and you've got yourself a spectroscopic camera. But if you want the high resolution, high quality calibrated uh, lab thing, you go to Thor Labs and you're going to spend, you know, two to four thousand dollars for your spectroscope. So the particular device that I'm talking about here is meant to measure wavelength, not necessarily flux or flo photon, photon density. And how do we do this? Well, it's a source effect. It's it's kind of a thing. I've often spoken about radiation reflection pressure, about how light can actually move things. And if you're unfamiliar with it, you can go back to uh, some noteworthy guys from the past, Kepler, Maxwell, Lebedev, Nichols and Hull, Bell and Green, or the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics for Optical Tweezers, and you can read all about it. But uh, suffice it to say, it's a minuscule amount of force and the amount of force is in um, typically billions of a newton, as, as they say. It's uh, a force so small, it's far less than you lifting a sheet of paper in the air. This would be maybe one one thousandth of that. So a very, very small force. But we now have technology that can measure those very tiny forces very reliably, digitally. But if you want to improve the amount of force the amount of momentum being transferred by the photons, there are things you can do. A shorter wavelength moving closer to UV increases the energy per photon, which increases the, the force, the amount of smack you're getting out of the photons. Shorter wavelengths more, longer wavelengths like infrared, less. How reflectivity is, how much reflectivity does the surface have? If you have higher reflectivity, um, more momentum gets transferred to it. If it's smoother, more momentum gets transferred to it. If the angle that you're hitting the surface, the reflective surface at, is narrower, more oblique, yeah. closer to a zero degree, a glancing angle, more momentum gets transferred. If it's 90 degrees to it, less. There's still some, but less. And I talked in length uh, about uh, using this particular physics principle for propulsion, but not tonight. Tonight we're going to be measuring the wavelength of those photons. 
So in the world of physics, you can often flip an effect, like a motor can become a generator or a generator can become a motor. This is how you get regenerative braking in electric vehicles. You know, you applied power to the motor and spun the wheels up. Now you want to come to a stop. You push the brake pedal and it flips the motor's electronics the other way around. So now the inertia of the spinning wheels turning the motor actually generates electricity. So in physics, you can often flip things back and forth and the physics is still working fine. So in the case of piezoelectrics, this is where you um, essentially apply um, a jolting force to a crystalline material and it will produce electricity. But has anyone ever heard of an electronic jackhammer? These are jackhammers that are not run by air compressors. They're run off of electricity. They're smaller, lighter weight. And I actually own one of those. And I used it for destroying the um, observatory dome building at Fox Observatory. It looks like a, a small chisel hammer. And huh. you apply electricity to it, and the vibration oscillation of the electricity makes the very small uh, surface of the back end of the metal thing being pushed back and forth, move back and forth just like very, very tiny amounts but it's moving back and forth so fast, you can use it as a chisel to like shave concrete. So you have pH per electric, which is in your bathroom scale. If you have a digital bathroom scale, uh, you're standing on crystals and the standing on the crystals produces electricity. And then they have an analog to digital converter to convert the electrical voltage level into a numerical quantity. And that's how it measures your weight. But you can flip it the other way around and make a jackhammer at it. Um, yeah. heat, heat can produce electricity. This is called the Seebeck effect. Or you can take electricity and produce cold. This is called the Peltier effect. And campground stoves nowadays, you can actually buy a Seebeck device for them. So when you're cooking your food or you're making your coffee, um, you can take the excess heat of the pot and use it to produce an electricity to recharge your cell phone. Oh, wow. So those those are actually things that are existing. You can go on Amazon and buy them. Um, in amateur astronomy, we use a Peltier. You apply electricity, it cools down your imaging chip so you get a uh, lower noise picture. And if you're into recreational vehicles and you've got a little refrigerator on board your recreational vehicle, there's a good chance that if it doesn't have a compressor, it's probably using a Peltier to reduce the temperature inside your refrigerator. You'll realize this because it takes a long time to get rid of the heat and it consumes a lot of electricity. So you don't want to run it on your battery because you run your battery down. So how would we re flip this radiation reflection pressure thing? Well, um, if you can take electricity and produce light that produces a transfer of momentum, then you should be able to take a light source like celestial, have it encounter a surface and have those photons pushing against a surface that is a piezoelectric crystalline material and cause it to produce a voltage that you can then measure. And based upon the wavelength of the photon, different amounts of energy will be imparted by momentum transfer to that piezoelectric material. I know it, it's like, so what? I've got a picture coming up, it'll, it'll be more obvious. But the idea is bring the light to your sensor, have your sensor be vibrated by the light, and then you measure the voltage off the piezoelectric from your sensor being buffeted about by light. This is all at like, billions of a millimeter, billions of a Newton that were measuring this. But even though I talk in billions of a whatever, you'll find that the actual science being conducted today, yeah, in January of last year, um, actually they work one one thousandth less than that. So when you think nano Newtons are, oh, that's imperceptible. No, no, science today is working at one one thousandth of a, Nano. So 
if we have control over the reflectivity of whatever surface the photons are hitting, that's fixed. It is what it is. Um, we have some control of the smoothness and the uniformity of the surface that the photons are hitting. We can bring the photons straight in at 90 degrees, so the angle of incidence is fixed. But the wavelength of the photon that hits the surface is variable based upon the photon that's coming in itself. So that's the variable. So if you have these fixed values, and the only variable is the wavelength of the photons coming in, then you can digitally measure the wavelength of the photons. This has nothing to do with solar sails. That's for propulsion for spacecraft and just like, yeah, that, that's, that's not to do with this. So not a part of it. And this is different from photometry. Now, if you're, if you're into amateur astronomy, you may have heard of photometry as it being kind of a sister to astronomical imaging. Imaging, you have lots of pixels to see an image. Photometry is like, there is a star, and I want to determine its color and its brightness. So you have a single pixel camera that will measure the brightness. And if you put red, green, blue filters on the front of it, and you take three measurements, you can now determine the color of that star. So the, the single pixel cameras for photometry, those are referred to as pin diodes or PN diodes or photodiodes or phototransistors, they're using the photoelectric effect. So the particular sensor material, the chemistry of it, uh, is such that when a photon of a particular range strikes that metallic uh, sensor, it will spit out electrons. And then it spits them into uh, essentially what amounts to a capacitance cell that stores up the electrons over a period of time and that becomes a voltage. And then you drain that out and you measure that voltage. And that will tell you how bright the star was over the amount of exposure time. And the reason why you have to have an exposure is um, one photon would not be enough to energize the material chemistry to get a good enough voltage out to make a reliable digital measurement. So you have to expose the material to lots of photons, a flux of them, to charge it up enough to fill up the well, and then you drain out the well as a voltage. Photometry can tell you how bright something is, and with filters it can tell you the various colors of it. But uh, since it's based upon materials chemistry and the photoelectric effect, which is based upon exciting um, electrons and moving up and down in shells, all that stuff, it still has gaps and what it can read. And here's where MEMS comes in, um, microelectromechanical systems. All this means is you're making little tiny integrated circuits that are so small that quantum level effects, you know, a billionth of a, a billionth of a meter, quantum level effects are what you're measuring. So in the case of a, an accelerometer, you might have a little tiny microscopic crystalline tongue that sticks out and it's inside of a little tiny coil and when you move the sensor rapidly in one direction or another the little tiny finger of material moves it, it's bent and as it gets bent it registers either a change in a field or produces a voltage and that's how you measure accelerometers and gyroscopes and magnetometers barometric pressure and even microphones Okay. This is a circuit board that has a MEMS-based microphone on it. And the microphone is the little silver tiny chip in the middle. Mm. So this is actually a full microphone. And it produces a digital result out. And I bought five of them in a package for, I think, $8. Oh. But you have to hook them up to a computer and write the software to read it out and things like that. But that's how real this technology is, is, you know, a watch that can tell when you flip your wrist to turn the display on, that's got a MEMS chip in it. Um, your mobile phone that can tell how fast you're going and uh, the fact that you rotated your phone 90 degrees to flip the display, that's MEMS chip technology. And that's just built into it. And the MEMS chips we're talking about are the internal 
technology is about the size of a grain of salt and wow. the price of them is about five cents. So yeah, they put them in everything. Yeah, I believe that. So here is kind of a concept for a new kind of a MEMS sensor. Imagine you had an equilateral triangle. There was a mirror, had a mirror surface. Very, very thin, very, very tiny. And you attached to each one of the apexes of the triangle a piezoelectric material, something that generates voltage when it gets jostled. And then you point that triangle at a, an aperture where your photons are coming in. When the photons hit the reflective surface, they will transfer momentum to it, and the momentum will bounce the triangle. And when it bounces the triangle, it will cause the piezoelectric crystals to produce a voltage. So depending upon how hard the photon hits the triangular mirror, it will generate what level of voltage. You don't need any capacitors to measure this. You don't need a well. You don't need a full-size pixel with all kinds of wiring going to it. You just need something that's going to measure the voltage of those three pieces of crystal. So you need a positive and a negative lead connected to the piezoelectrics. And that's the only circuit you need to, to hook to this thing. And it will be down in the like, you know, probably uh, 10 micron level size for the diameter of the triangle. And the individual little fingers of piezoelectric material are probably going to be about one micron. So you're talking about something so small you wouldn't be able to see it with the human eye. But we have the technology, we're doing amplification of billions of an ampere, billions of a volt level voltages. So we can amplify the signal up, run it through an analog to digital converter, and now based upon the light pressure on that little triangle, we can take the digital value and use that to evaluate the color of the light that just struck that little triangle. Remember, closer to ultraviolet, you get a harder smack. Closer to infrared, you get a lighter smack. So visually, based upon the number, you'll be able to tell what color light hit that little triangle. So, yeah. Now, the benefit of this is you don't need to have any uh, photon to electron conversions inside of some kind of metallic chemistry material, as you do with regular cameras. There's no ionization going on here. So you don't have to worry about the photoelectric effect. And it's continuous because there's no electron excitation chemistry that says it can only be this number, but not that number and no number in between. It can be any value that a photon comes in with, you can read out the value. There's no exposure required. It's direct reading. You don't have to wait for like a half a second to get the image. You can read the photon wavelength directly because it's a voltage, it's not a capacitance. It's digital. You don't have to worry about putting color filters on fronts of things. It'll actually read the color out directly. And since there's no capacitance to be charged, it's nearly instantaneous. So if you wanna, you probably have seen those videos about very, very fast cameras and how they need very, very bright lights. Um, this would be a very, very fast camera because it's instantaneously reading the value out and it, it doesn't need any lights. Whatever photons come in is all it needs to measure. It doesn't need to have an exposure. It just reads it directly. So you'll finally have one-shot multi-spectral capture that doesn't require filters. And each sensor is not monochromatic. Each triangle could actually read whatever color you can read out with your analog to digital converter. And there's no Bayer matrix. Each triangle could be a pixel and each pixel can have a completely different value. Ooh. But you need to determine like, okay, given the triangle is that big and the crystalline filaments are this big, how much power they can produce and you know whether or not your amplifier is good enough to, to raise the voltage or your analog to digital converter can sense it. There's all kinds of factors that you have to make the best. But remember, you don't have the original Amana radar range. You have one that went through multi-generations of improvements of technology, higher volume manufacturing, lower cost, and then distribution to lots of stores. So 
this is a concept. Here are the things they need to pay attention to to make it better and better and better, what to improve. So it's possible to start here, but you don't end here. You start here. And like I said, you have to calibrate it. You have to expose a particular MEMS sensor technology to a variety of different colors of light to know what the curve is of the actual digital value coming out, and you create a table that maps that. If you think that's not the case with cameras today, oh, there are all sorts of what are known as color profiles. And there's an organization called the ICC that internationally creates the color profiles based upon the chemistry of the semiconductors used in video cameras. So when that brightness comes in and it happens to be under the red filter, it knows what the chemistry of the red filter is. It knows what the chemistry of the monochrome sensor is. And then it can say, here's the range of red values it can produce. And each one of those red values has an electron volt level for it. So they know exactly what the calibration of the camera is. This would need the same thing. But I'm thinking that with this technology, not only can you go from into UV, maybe not X-ray, but certainly into UV, all the way down through visible into infrared. And I'm going to guess that maybe even microwave radio as long mm -hmm. as as long as the wavelength of the microwave is something that fits onto the little reflector. Now, if it's so large that it's, it's too wide to make the reflector actually feel the pressure, then it's obviously not going to measure something with wavelength that long. What about interference? As the saying goes, this thing's so damn sensitive it can register a grasshopper landing in the middle of Kansas. Well, kind of. <laughs> Kinda, yeah. You need to make sure that you're only reading what you plan on reading. In other words, if there's light pollution, it'll pick up the light pollution. Telescopes have baffle tubes and dew shields to make sure that it's only getting the light from the source, and you'll still need that. Remember that it's at the nano scale. So if you remember the history of the uh, gravitational wave observatory, LIGO, uh, they found that they had to isolate the... Uh, the laser tube itself in a vacuum, and then they had to isolate the mirrors at the ends of the laser tube with quartz fibers that suspend the 60-pound mirrors. And then they found out that trucks driving around like outside the building would actually register as gravity waves because it was that sensitive. And then they found out that if a person is heavy enough and they're wearing hard-soled shoes, as they walk down the, you know, like, multi-kilometer corridor next to the measurement tube, you can actually see every time their foot hits the ground and it registers gravity wave. Well, this is the same sort of thing. This is going to register photons by the momentum that they're going to impart onto that little triangular mirror, which means that if you do a lot of heavy-footed walking around your sensor, every time your foot hits the ground, it's likely to vibrate the mirror and cause a noise, an electronic noise. So you have to figure out a way to filter out that. And usually it's, you wait until everything's calm and quiet, then you take your observation. And if, if you see a lot of noise, not a good time to take a, an observation, which is not too different from, hey, an airplane just went overhead. Let's throw away that frame of my capture. Or I can't take really good pictures here. The, the light's too bright. Same sort of thing. Or, hey, a cloud just went through my image field of view and I, I can't get an observation. So you may have to either isolate the sensor on a mount, you know, like either air isolated in, in a, uh, a pressurized uh, cell, or you might want to suspend it in vacuum on quartz um, filaments. But uh, yeah, pay attention to it. So I found that um, analog filtering would, would not need to be an option. If you think about um, monochrome cameras, they'll at least have a filter on the front. They will knock out stray light beyond, like they'll have a band pass filter on the front. It you know, removes infrared light that would cause an overexposure, or it removes UV light in the case of other observations like looking at the sun. So it'll still need those kind of filters. Those are just high radiation filters. But at the lowest level, you, you wouldn't need the typical filters, the red, green, blue, or the infrared. And the reason is 
all the readout is digital. So uh -huh. you should be able to read from UV down through visible, infrared, maybe even the microwave radio, uh, radio uh, wavelengths. You wouldn't need to have a special device just for reading infrared. Like right now, if you want to read infrared, you go by yourself what is known as a bolometer, which uh, as light hits the pixels, the pixels act like little resistors, and you judge the voltage going through the resistors as whatever the brightness is inversely of the infrared. Well, if you could read infrared directly, you, you wouldn't need to go to FLIR and spend a lot of money for a infrared-only camera. This also becomes kind of an interesting thing. Dynamic digital filtering. If you can read the digital imprint of the photon striking that little triangle, and you can judge digitally the energy value of the photon striking it, now you can go back and apply a simple mathematical algorithm to whatever you read in to say, strip out all the infrared. Well, how would you know what the infrared is? That's all the low voltage stuff. Strip out all the UV. That's all the high voltage stuff. You could have a band yeah. filter. I just want visible. So anything too high, anything too low, just delete those samples and you get visible. So what used to be like a glass filter that you'd have to either pay to have coated glass or you'd pay a lot of money and get the coloring baked into the glass itself. And that way you can have your red and green and blue filters or your uh, grayscale filter for shooting the moon. That all just becomes digital post-processing of whatever values you receive. That's an interesting, like we don't need no stinking filters anymore. So what about the uh, the accumulated spectrum? The, the How do I read a spectrum out of this? Well, it's it's active. As the light comes in, you can measure the wavelengths directly. So if in a certain part of your image, you have more blue and less red, those little triangles will receive more blue and less red. So more energy, not less energy. So you're directly reading the color. And if you say, well, how do I separate out the different colors if that little triangle is reading like all the colors at once? It's exactly the same Fourier analysis that is used if, if you know that there's a musical soundtrack that also contains voices, you can remove the voices from the musical soundtrack because you know the frequency spectrum of the voice, and you just go in and make a Fourier analysis, uh, frequency domain, remove those frequencies, the voice goes away and you're left with just the music. That's a thing you can do nowadays. Same concept, but you're removing the frequencies of light that you don't want to be measuring through Fourier analysis. Okay, and I had to draw this for the people that might actually be, when they see this video video publicly, they might actually be um, somebody that uh, understands MEMS technology and has access to a MEMS fabrication facility. So the little kind of white triangle, that's our little reflector, and the sort of teal blue things at the corners, those are our piezoelectric filaments. And then the orange thing going around it that's our uh, positive and negative conductors to get the voltage off the filaments. So that's a top-down view. So the light would come in and poke the triangle and cause the triangle to get jostled. And when it gets jostled, it would strain the piezoelectric crystals, causing them to produce a voltage. And if you look at it from a, a side view, you need some material on the bottom of the chip that will be like a little shock absorber. So you can move the chip around and it won't immediately detect things. And then you have the actual um, substrate, the, the gray area, the light gray area, that's the chip. And then you have inside of that, you have the uh, the conductors going around the outside of the triangle. And then you have the little teal blue filaments, little piezoelectric. And then in the center of it, you have the mirror. So the mirror will move up and down, straining the crystals based upon the amount of energy in the photon that strikes it. And the voltage is carried away to a low noise amplifier that then amplifies it up and then sends it through an analog to digital conversion component called an ADC. And that's what actually gives you your numeric result. So we've seen one triangle. If you make the triangle really, 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 really small, it'll work for photometry. But then if you can make it really small and you can re reproduce lots of them and hook up all the wiring, you could make an array of them. You can make an imaging array and you wouldn't need any Bayer matrix filters on top of them. And you wouldn't need any uh, wells. You wouldn't need any capacitance wells to, to build up an exposure. 
because of direct reading. That would allow you to make pixels that are denser and smaller than CMOS, so than the camera in your phone, probably four to 16 times more pixels per square millimeter. If it's comparing it against a CCD camera used in astronomy, you don't need the six transistors normally associated with a CCD pixel. There are no transistors. There's no capacitors. You don't need a reset line to discharge the transistors. It's always direct reading. And how small could you make it? Well, if you had the lithography technology to make it that small, you could actually make the triangle dimensions down to 10 nanometers. Now, why would you stop at 10 nanometers? Because if you get below 10 nanometers, you start getting into quantum tunneling effects, and you would randomly have a photon that makes no interaction with the triangle at all and just goes right between the atoms of the triangle. It's just like, doop, never saw it. So you want to keep it large enough that it'll actually impact the triangle and transfer some momentum. Now, what's, what's the, um, the typical size of a pixel nowadays? Well, the limit is 10 nanometers here on D. The, the typical pixel you'll see is at around three micrometers. Now remember, a nanometer is one one thousandth of a micrometer. So you could go literally 300 times smaller and still not deal with quantum tunneling effects. So you could have 300 by 390,000. You could have 90,000 more pixels than a good quality camera can have today. Not 90,000 more, 90,000 times as many pixels. So this would be good for making higher and higher resolution cameras for a long time to come. And because there's fewer steps in making the integrated circuit, fewer etchings and things like that, and you don't need to bake on any coatings and such, simpler, saves time, cost, fewer components, you get higher quality, higher yields, you don't need the extra filters. So Every pixel is identical. You don't have like red, green, and blue pixels. Every pixel is literally identical. So greater uniformity, greater yields. If uh, if you get the right people interested, it's kind of a no-brainer. So the benefits of having this kind of sensor for imaging is the fastest picture you can take is as fast as you can read it out. The greatest sensitivity you can have is a combination of your low noise amplifier and your ADC. How fast your ADC can read out the digital value, determines how fast you can read an array. But if you ever looked at one of the image sensors today, they only have one analog to digital converter, and they actually read out columns and rows of pixels, and they run them through. So the readout time across a row or a column is based upon how fast the analog to digital converter can convert one pixel. And then you clock it, next pixel, and then you clock it, next pixel, and you read out all those digital values into rows and columns. Well, if, if you can make these chips smaller and simpler, you can afford to put an analog to digital converter at the end of every row or at the end of every column. You could literally, in parallel, read an entire set of rows or an entire set of columns. Something you cannot do today would be just too expensive. And the, the analog to do digital converters would occupy too much space on the chip. So by having more space and cheaper design, yeah, you, you can make a camera that be a whole lot faster than today. You talk about 240 frames per second, you could be talking about millions of frames per second. You would have your true one-shot color camera that would take you from UV probably all the way into microwave radio. No Bayer matrix filters. Um, you wouldn't have to do multi-pass, you know, red, green, blue, and brightness. Take your five hours out in the middle of the Everglades shooting images and convert it to like 10 minutes because you don't have to create stacks of frames for different colors. Professional grade video cameras wouldn't need three sensors for red, green, and blue that merge and give a high quality color camera image. Um, you wouldn't need infrared filters. You could just filter it out digitally by discarding the data that's below a certain threshold. You would be able to do spectroscopic stuff just doing a Fourier analysis on the digital values you're reading out. You'd have far more pixels and they'd be smaller. Pixel density would go up, tighter packaging. Um, you wouldn't be reliant upon molecular chemistry of this, the, the metallicity of the sensor. Um, no more um, electron excitation gaps. Um, you wouldn't need a 
infrared blocking filter to avoid overexposure. Um, you might still want to cover slip on the front because this thing will be so sensitive that a dust particle, a little like little wound up spring looking microscopic piece of dust would cover hundreds of pixels. So you want to put the clear glass cover strip on top of that and then just clean that off with some air. But what about how many photons are striking it? The source flux, the, the density of the photons. If the photons are of the same wavelength for the particular uh, pixel that it's hitting, then it's a simple mathematical sum. If I get a pixel of, let's just make up a number here, 10 nanometers, and I'm reading out a 20 nanometer value, um, that's unlike how electron excitation works. That's a multiplier. Multipliers aren't integral in nuclear chemistry. So it's very simple that if you get a number that's a multiple of a particular photon, then you obviously have a flux and you can just divide it up. And when we get to the research paper at the very end, you'll see that it was very simple for me to just, I can tell how many pixels, sorry, how many photons are hitting their sensor by the value that they're reading out. It's just a divide. But what about heating? See, if this little tiny mirror is moving around a lot and you're striking the mirror at 90 degrees, some of the photons will get converted to heat, which means it's going to produce infrared. So you want to make the mirrored surface as reflective as possible to make sure you don't transition photons to heat. So you might want to start with, you know, typical glass mirror, silicon dioxide, quartz, uh, move up to alumina, which is aluminum oxide, um, or you might even want to go to silver or gold or titanium. You might want the mirror material to be made out of as pure titanium as you can get, because then you could do UV all the way down to radio and it would still reflect. If you remember the James Webb Space Telescope, they were looking in infrared, so their, their mirrors were beryllium copper metallic, and then they coated them with gold. Not a thick layer of gold, you know, uh, uh, one-fifth the thickness, the, the width of a uh, wavelength of yellow light. So very, very, very thin gold. So you might want to consider coating this uh, little triangle in uh, gold or just make the triangle out of titanium. So how do you determine if the concept is viable? Well, first you're going to need a MEMS chip fabrication facility, which I don't have access to. And the first run, they, they can't just produce one of those chips. You probably got to produce a wafer that has like 100 chips on it. On your first batch run, make those little triangles as small as your fab can make them. Make them as reflective as possible. But, you know, it's your first run. You just want to prove that it's really doing what you expect it to do. So you might not start out with the most expensive components, just start out with what you can do. Fabs have available runtime on them if you're willing to spend the money for it. And they would probably welcome the opportunity to put their fab to use if you've got the, you know, if you're hundred thousand dollars to do a run. I don't. Your analog to digital converter, well, if, if you make it as fast as possible, you can read it out as fast as possible. If you're reading it out into your average general purpose computer, uh, you can do the fast Fourier analysis for post-processing and see a lot of information right away. So if you shine different colors of light on it and it reads out different values, the physics process of it is working. So it's pretty easy to determine if conceptually this will be viable, but first you have to have a fab. I don't have a fab. What about the durability? These are nanoscale items, and they'll be just as durable as any other MEMS chip. You keep it covered, keep it protected from debris, and there's no lifespan on it. It's it's you know, it's quantum level semiconductor technology, so very durable. However, if you happen to shine hard X rays or gamma rays onto it, it may actually smack the little triangle so hard that it fractures the piezoelectric crystals. So if you, if you think about um, astronomical imaging cameras and they get stuck pixels or dark or bright pixels, if you shine hard X-ray or gamma into this sensor, it'll smack the little triangle so hard it fractures or damages the piezoelectric crystal and that pixel would now be stuck or dead. So there's the possibility of doing that 
But if you make it out of the right materials, there is no light that will ever cause it to get stuck because it's moving at such a small level and the readout is so small, it'll work. You could have an analog to digital converter that would go bad, but this chip's going to be simple enough. Once they get them into mass production, they're going to be, you're going to see that uh, digital cameras just get incredibly cheap. Of course, that's just my opinion. I could be right. So how do you judge the results of this thing? Well, you compare it against what we have today, regular cameras. If you can make a camera that's simpler, cheaper, fewer parts, fewer production line steps to, to build it, and you can still measure the same kinds of colors, and it does it faster without all the filters and Bayer matrix and stacking and direct readout, then that kind of proves the point. But you also have to get uh, to a point where the environment is free of noise, and you have to judge what's the minimum sensitivity, the maximum sensitivity, you know, what's the shortest wavelength, longest wavelength, and your analog to digital converter. If you use like an 8-bit converter, that's not enough steps. 10-bit converter, you're getting close. 12 bits is probably the minimum, but I would want to go to like 24 bits. So I see lots of steps of value. How would you improve this thing? So once you, you've proven it and you know it's a, it's a real deal, how would you improve it? As they do with cameras, define a standardized interface for talking to it so that people can write applications and they can go get chips from different vendors and know how to read out the data directly. And once it catches on, you'll find that lots of processing software will get the ability to read this out. Once it reads out the data, all the back-end processing, all the post-processing for imaging is the same. That doesn't change at all. It's just the upfront image capture that changes. So once you have a standardized interface for this, you can start working on the other side, the back end, making the low noise amplifier even more sensitive and with lower noise. The analog to digital converter, more bits, more steps, less noise, uh, anti-aliasing in it to not cross steps. At that point, uh, as the saying goes, the sky's the limit, but it's not the sky, it's how much do you want to do with the technology that's now available to you? So um, the benefits you're gonna get out of this are, are already listed, but the benefits you'll notice is direct reading, is continuous reading, ultra high sampling rate, um, no exposure times. You'll be able to read it off of uh, uh, essentially anything that's producing photons. It, you're, you know, Even if there's a delay going through an analog to digital converter, you're still talking about being able to do um, many thousands to millions of samples per second. If you're concerned about flux, flux is just a summation. You can make the sample time shorter. You'll make your analog to digital converters read faster. And now you don't have to worry about flux as much because not as much flux per unit time would be impacting the sensor. What about radio? Well, as I was saying, as long as the wavelength fits within the size of the triangle of the sensor, then it should be able to read in radio as well. So you're not going to get you know, long wave AM. You're not going to use this as an AM radio tuner, but you might use it as an ultra high frequency radio tuner. And if you could do that, you could actually point it at the sky and you could see live images of radio transmissions. So for example, if you wanted to see where a geostationary satellite is, you could point this camera at the sky, and then you could tell the software, get rid of anything that's higher energy than microwave radio. And now, even in the daytime, you're only looking at microwave radio in the sky, and all of these sources that are bright, you'd be able to pick up their particular wavelength, and you'd not only tell how bright the satellite is transmitting in flux, you'd also be able to tell what frequency it's transmitting on. So the things you can do when you have access to the technology. So I, w I was deep into the rabbit hole of understanding how all this stuff might work. And I said, I can't be the only one that's ever thought of this. And you know what? I'm not. In the journal Nature Reports from January of 2023, there was actually a team that built a MEMS chip that does this. And the title of the report is, micro cantilever based current balance for precise measurement of the photon force. That's a gobbledygook way of saying 
photons hitting something were, be, were able to be measured digitally. So if you see this picture here, you see the little orange rectangle? That's the mirrored surface. And then you see the black line going out on that like diving board two rail thing. That's actually magnetic field coils. And they were measuring the um, deflection of the end of this finger within a um, magnetic field. So as the end of it deflects, they weren't measuring voltage coming off of the mirror. They were measuring the deflection of that coil within the magnetic field that they had established. And that changes and produces a voltage, and that's what they were measuring. Now, what did they actually measure? So I was talking about nanonewtons, billions of a newton. They measured forces as high as 67.5 piconewtons. A piconewton is one one thousandth of a nanonewton. So they're already a thousand times more sensitive than my concept. Now, what's the resolution? How far apart is their analog to digital converter steps? 30 femtonewtons. What's well, a femtonewton? There's a nanonewton, which is a billionth of a newton. And then there's a piconewton, which is a thousandth of a nanonewton. And then a femtonewton is a thousandth of a piconewton. So they're already getting confirmed scientific observational results to the point where they could publish it in Nature Reports magazine in January of 2023. But they're using a magnetic field Whereas I think you can take it even lower by using a piezoelectric effect instead of a magnetic field, because a magnetic field is going to be affected by all kinds of magnetic fields around it, like the magnetic field of the Earth. And they were mentioning in their report that they had to compensate for which way the sensor was placed as it was against or in alignment with the acceleration of the Earth gravitational field. That's how sensitive it is. Because remember, a MEMS chip includes a magnetometer, which can measure the Earth's magnetic field. That's how you know which direction is north. There are people already working in this stuff. I look at it as this report is not the end all. This report is just confirmation that there's apparently enough interest in this technology that there's enough money for them to get a semiconductor fab run of MEMS chips that are designed like that. I'm working with just pure, you know, PowerPoint content concept. They're working with demonstrable technology, and they've already done it and published. So what's next for them? Well, I read their report, and they were crazy enough to put the email address of the principal scientist where people like me could see it. So I sent him an email saying, have you tried piezoelectric technology? And your mirror seems to be not as reflective as it could be. And I pointed out that if your mirror, instead of being perfectly flat, was actually an inverted cone, you could actually capture more photons because the photons that hit the outer edge of a mirror are all 90 degrees. The photons that hit the inside of the cone would be at an uh, oblique angle and would actually transfer more momentum to the uh, sensor. So you could have higher value readouts if instead of your mirror being flat, your mirror was ion beam etched at the like 10 nanometer level to be a little tiny cone. So I sent that to him earlier this week. We'll see if he's like, ah, I should just the crackpot. I'll ignore that email or if he actually replies to it because the email did successfully get delivered. So we'll see. And when people think that this is not possible, photons don't have that much uh, energy and they're massless, right? Well, neutrinos were once thought to be massless. Now we know they're not. They just have very, very tiny mass. Photons do have energy, and energy is equivalent to momentum, and momentum, if it is imparted on something, is mass. So you can calculate out, based upon the particular wavelength of a photon, what its uh, Newton's level, what, you know, what its nanonewtons momentum it can transfer. And there's a formula for calculating at what angle you, know, you can get the maximum output. 
So I went back and took their report and I broke it down and I found they were using a um, near infrared laser, 4.2 milliwatt. Remember your, your low end typical laser pointer is five milliwatt. So they were using a laser that was less powerful than a cheapy laser pointer. That was their laser. And it was specifically 1,310 nanometers. That's in near infrared. So from that, and their measurements, I could go back in and say, well, how many photons were they getting in their sensor? When they were reading their maximum sensor value of 67.2 piconewtons, you divide that up based upon the wavelength and the energy, and you find that the number of photons hitting their sensor was 1.38 times 10 to the 17, which to me says their exposure was really long. They need to shorten up that exposure and I looked at their data and they were using a 16-bit analog to digital converter and they were only sampling at 10,000 samples per second. So that would explain their 30 femtonewton resolution. If they sampled faster, they could reduce that resolution to a much smaller number. So they have more work to do. So in conclusion, in the realm of physics, you can often flip things around backwards to do something different. Motors can be generators, generators can be motors, piezoelectric, you can have weight to voltage, voltage to force, heat, you can have heat to electricity, or electricity can produce cold. You can have the um, source radiation of something transfer momentum and strain a piezoelectric material and produce a voltage. So you can measure the impact of a photon on a surface with no photoelectric ionization. So it's not based upon the chemistry or, you know, integral amounts that these photons will excite the electron, but other photons of a different energy won't. No more gaps. You can have imagers that have higher resolution, higher frame rate, probably a lower cost once they get them in volume production. You can produce full color with a single pass. Professional video cameras would no longer need three sensors. All of your Color filtering can be done digitally in software, pretty easy. And the other thing that came to mind was the concept of focusing. If focusing is nothing more than uh, an extremely tiny redshift in things, you could focus digitally too. Just That was just a, a thought that came like, if I can measure it to this level, then what else can I do with it? And took a while, so lots of links. And I actually have a link to the report if anybody wants to dig through the minutiae of that rabbit hole. Comments, yeah, questions? I'm thinking of your uh, drawing of the individual cell. Yes. Uh, the mirror sits on a substrate, which is sitting on a, uh, like a buffer, a cushion. Now, if, if, if you go back and look at it, the, the triangle was actually sitting on top of a black area. Oh, and the black area is etched out. It, it, you etch out a well, and the uh, reflector is actually sitting in free space above the bottom of the chip. Okay, I got it. Yeah, that's why it's black around I the triangle. It's sitting on something. Yeah. All no, right. it's not. There's there's nothing beneath it. It's it's relying upon the three piezoelectric filaments to hold it in free space. Gotcha. Okay. Which probably means um, you cut out the area around the triangle, and you leave the fingers on the end of the triangle to bridge over to the electrical circuit, and then you deposit the piezoelectric crystal material on top of the filaments. Yeah, yeah, it's doing double duty then. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's suspending it because there's nothing below it, because if you had something below it, it would bottom out. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm thinking of that, yeah. No, nope, no, nope. it's gotta be sitting over free space so that it can deflect as much as it needs to. But as much as it needs to is probably going to be on the order of um, picometers, you know, yeah. thousands of a nanometer. Tiny stuff, but mm -hmm. that's just what they do in silicon wafer technology nowadays. And if, if you think it's rare or expensive, like, you know, it, it's in watches, it's in mobile phones, it's cheap. This stuff is boggling the mind. <laughs> I, you know, I see a YouTube video on how they make memory chips. Yes. And, and the, just the, the, the zillions of them, mm -hmm. and, and how each one 
has a little function. Yep. And they make hundreds of them, and they make thousands of them. And Maybe. They're, they're now at 30 billion transistors on a wafer. So a wafer is like 8, 10, 12 inches across. And they put 30 billion individual transistors on one wafer. The mechanics of each individual one transistor mm -hmm. is amazing that it can be done. Well, they, they shoot um, <laughs> probably 20, maybe a little less than 20 layers. So yeah. they're etching, and yeah. then they're adding, and then they're etching, and then they're adding, and then they're yeah. etching away some of what they added, and they keep I, doing this. They're making three-dimensional towers that's on right. chips now. I mean, they, they started with something called FinFETs. These are um, field effect transistors. That's the actual transistor, is a field yeah. effect transistor. Yeah. But then they said, we can only make them so small before we get quantum tunneling effects yes. on the surface. So what did they do? They said, well, what if we tilt them up 90 degrees? So now we can pack, you know, a thousand times as many transistors in the same space. They said, well, what? Well, why don't we make them like uh, a condominium tower? So what, yeah. they now, what are they doing now is they have a structure that they turn 90 degrees, and then they put uh, a fin, a, a fet at different elevations up the tower, and they connect them all together. So now they can get instead of, you know. And they connect them all together. That is magic. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I knew they were getting small years ago when I got to see inside of a chip. And I could hold it up to white light, and the white light would become a rainbow uh, because the scale of the, the features were so small, it was acti actually breaking up the wavelengths of light. That's how you saw that rainbow is. The edge was acting like a little knife grating and was causing a rainbow. And now they're well beyond that. Yeah. At some point, the, the features of the chips are going to be so small that they won't interact with photons at all. And you'll, you'll take off the lid of the chip and you go, I don't see the chip in there. It's in there, trust me. But it looks black. Yeah, because the features are so small, the photons are bigger. Ooh. Photons don't interact with the material at all. Oh, that would be interesting. Even a facility that has to be that clean. That, oh, yes. you know, unbelievable. Humans are dirty. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, um, if, if you look at some of the labs in South Korea or China, um, maybe a couple of them like Intel has in the U.S., you'll find that the chips are actually worked at different stations. And they take the, the, the wafers with the chips on them while they're still putting layers in. And they go down like a long hallway of stations and the conveyor that conveys the wafers from one station to another has to be vacuum sealed and pristine of any debris whatsoever. Yeah. So you see these overhead rails and these little little boxes go zooming past at pretty high speeds and there's wafers in there going to the next fabrication layer and they just like zoom it around. That way they can put one set of wafers into a station and have it processed and then it comes out and goes to the next one, and it can process there while the next batch are coming into that first station again. So they can overlap it. So it just keeps all these little boxes flying around all the time. And obviously, computers control the process. Yes, of course. People Human beings would be yeah, too yeah. fallible because each one of those wafers, and they stack probably 20 wafers in a box, each one of those wafers probably has a couple of thousand dollars worth of components on it. Oh, yeah. Zero defects. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No defects. It is fascinating yeah. stuff. Uh, so if you think this was a little harebrained, although I did find a report that people are actually working on this, next week we go the other direction. This week we're sensing photons and determining their wavelength by radiation reflective pressure at a MEMS chip level. Next up is... I want to generate an arbitrary photon. I want to be able to tell the computer, I want this particular wavelength of light to be generated. Okay. <laughs> Turns out there's actually a principle in physics for doing that very thing, but they've never applied it to 
actually producing different wavelengths. They've only applied it for producing a very specific wavelength, and that's x-rays. There is a technique where when you spit out electrons and they encounter tungsten atoms, the electrons will either be bent or absorbed and then re-radiated by the atoms of the metal. When they're bent, they'll actually decelerate. And as they decelerate, in order to maintain the conservation of energy, they have to spit out a photon. And depending upon the amount of voltage you apply to make the electrons head for the target to go from the anode to the cathode, um, you can generate x-rays from that. There are principles of our mechanical reality mm -hmm. that we haven't learned about yet. And when you're getting down to that small and yes. that lightweight and that sensitive, yep. things are kicking in that we don't understand yet. That well, we have asked about yeah and that that's fine and i've often asked myself about some of these things like is it really possible to do that yeah. and turns out yeah like if you take white light and you present it to a quartz crystal and you drill holes through the quartz crystal and the diameter of the holes is exactly the right size to fit a certain wavelength of light then only that color light will go through the hole. Yeah. So you can take a composite fiber optic data communications beam at different frequencies. You can put all that into one fiber and out the end of the fiber comes essentially white light. But the white light is comprised of all the individual channels of different colors oh, for the yeah. fiber optic communication. You then run them through this quantum interference filter and all the individual holes match the particular photon emitter wavelengths from the source of the fiber optic communication it allows you to with with no prisms whatsoever with nothing moving nothing mechanical you can take that composite white light beam off the fiber optic and split it out to the channels with no moving parts nothing mechanical uh, yeah that, that's got, the, that's just something that's in fiber optics nowadays. It less wheels running, less motors, less, yeah. less anything. Yeah. So yeah. the closer we get to doing things at the quantum level, yes. it gets easier, cheaper, higher density, faster, no moving parts, lower maintenance, longer durability, uh, higher quality. But these things are not really understood yet, what, what happens at that. Uh, where we don't know what an electron really is. Well, that's, that's where we kind of stop at just about 10 nanometers, because once it gets to quantum tunneling, it's probabilistic. Will it work like you want it to or not? You're not really sure. So don't the, make it too small. The probability that this thing is going to work. When I, <laughs> yeah. Well, remember quantum computers. Quantum computers, they talk about qubits and a qubit is not one digital bit. You might need six or eight qubits to make one reliable digital bit because it's iffy and, you know, something going by and, you know, an electrical field impacting it or a bright light encountering the core of the quantum computer could skew everything all to hell. And so you need extra bits that you run through algorithms that will say, okay, if I've got six bits and five out of the six are all saying the same thing, I can ignore that sixth bit. It's noise. It's bad. But if five of them are all saying the same thing, that's your value. Well, what if it's a three, two vote borderline? Uh, well, if you use six, you can get a three, three vote. So you probably want to be using five or seven. So you don't have to worry about odd man out. And they actually do this stuff inside of quantum computers. The first time I encountered that, it was in uh, memory chips. When uh, DRAM memory chips, the cells in the DRAMs got to be so small that alpha particles in the coating of the chip, like the, the, the ceramic coating that made up the chip, the coating occasionally would randomly spit out alpha particles. And the alpha particle was changing the state of the DRAM bit. 
It wasn't destroying. It was just like occasionally a bit would flip. Yeah. But what you did was you put in more columns. If you had a 32-bit computer, yeah. you had um, 37 um, actual bits of memory. And you would run the value you read out as 32 bits plus 5, 37 bits into a Hamming decoder. And the Hamming decoder would tell you what the actual value was. So, yeah. yeah. DRAM chips are unreliable, but they've compensated for that. Yeah. Um, rotating media magnetic storage, hard disks. When you look at hard disks, yes. hard disks go off the deep end on Hamming code. You might have um, 33 bits worth of redundancy uh, per track on the disk. You might have entire cylinders of the disk devoted to uh, repair action. So if you got a hard error on a track at a cylinder, you might just, you know, stop using that one. It's got bad stuff on it. Right. Go down to another layer to a spare and put all that data here. And now we're back online. Yeah, there's always spare. A little yeah. Extra. yeah. Flash memory is the same thing. Flash memory is now the individual flash cells are so small that they can't be perfect. You can't make them perfect when you fabricate them. So they're built in with redundancies from the get-go. So when they make them, if, if you go buy a 256 gigabyte micro SD card, there may be 20 megabytes worth of spare in that chip, but percentage of the total it's still noise. But when they made the chip, they had to go in and rewire at the like software scale inside the chip to say, well, that entire row is no good. Go use this row. And that's just that just matter of fact part of the manufacturing process. And nobody thinks of it. I've I bought a 256 gigabyte micro SD card and I got my 256 gigabytes. So that's all you care about. The fact that it's actually, you know. 256.2 gigabytes. Eh, who cares? Things are much more reliable than they used to be. They, oh, yes. they, lots of errors. Yes. I I uh, was in a restaurant and I got my bill and I'm figuring, how does this machine know what the taxes should be? <laughs> so much for my sandwich and so much for tax. And they they're, never make a mistake. They're programmed for that. They never make a mistake. It's always I, 70%. <laughs> And yes, I've worked with point of sale systems and yeah, they're actually tax tables and they get pretty complicated because you have federal tax, state okay. tax, county tax, city municipal tax. And then you have taxes that are only good for a year and expire and all kinds of stuff. And then what kind of product is being sold on a line item basis? You go into a grocery store. If you remember, is that a taxable item or a non-taxable item? They have to use they used to have to figure that out. So the person running the cash register had to go, oh, that's taxable. That's not. Oh, yeah, the state of Florida is having a tax off because you're buying school supplies or diapers. No tax today. Eh. You have to worry about all that stuff. It's now programmed. And these things are pretty damn accurate. You know? <laughs> they always I, get it right. Yeah. yeah. It didn't used to be like that. Well. There was a window of time in computer history where things were not accurate. Yes. There was a particular uh, version uh, of was Intel. Right. Yeah, there was a particular version of an Intel microprocessor that the floating point unit inside the chip that did all the floating point math did a couple of things that were wrong. If you input this value and then you divide by that value, you won't get the correct answer. And rather than recalling all those chips they worked with microsoft and other operating system providers to go in and say if the inputs this value and the outputs that value give them the correct value not what the chip says okay yeah. so they actually corrected the error in the chip through operating oh. system software yeah <laughs> do not trust this chip yeah um they don't have that problem anymore they're more accurate, more reliable than that. But, uh, yep, the process exists to correct aspects of manufacturing inaccuracy and reliability. 
when you're working with things that small, just what you do. Matter of fact, you just do it. It's hard. To, it, it, it's hard to comprehend. Yeah. What's going on. It's all smaller than microscopic. You know, yep. atomic. I well, don't get they're not down to the atomic. They're certainly down to um, you know a thousandth of a thousandth of a meter. That's pretty, that's, that's pretty small. That's not atomic yet, but it's getting close. I just put my yardstick back in the closet. It was, <laughs> I, did. I have to be concerned when I'm measuring things at the millimeter level. Uh, how accurate is that to a half a millimeter? Because my, my, my 3D printer can print to a one quarter millimeter accuracy. Mm. I can print a height of a third of a millimeter of plastic. That's a remarkable. I can literally print something would be, um, if you ever got sunburn and you peel off your dead skin and you see how thin that is, yeah. I can actually print PLA plastic that thin. <laughs> Just as a, a joke, I did that once. I printed something the size of a postage stamp that was literally a third of a millimeter thick. I let it cool down, and yeah. because of the surface that I print on, it just comes right off. I peeled it off, and you could wiggle it, and it would wiggle in air, like like dead skin. <laughs> but like, temperatures yeah. would change its size anyway, wouldn't it? Tem but temperature, it does change size because it's PLA plastic. Yeah. yeah. So a it was actually thinner when I melted the plastic to print it than when it cooled down and I pulled it off the, the print plate. So it went from you know a third of a millimeter to maybe three eighths of a millimeter. That's not a machine in a lab. That's something you have that consumers can buy. I, I I think when I bought it, when they first came out, it was around three hundred dollars, and it was partially assembled. It took me less than thirty minutes to assemble it and get it running, and it's very reliable. Um, some of some three D print printers are a bit cantankerous. The uh, Cartesian ones are pretty cantankerous because there's a lot of lever arm stuff moving. I have always known as a costal delta. That's the one where you see it's like three columns coming up and the head moves like this on the bottom on three sets of arms. And it's very fast. It, it, it can move the head at 100 millimeters per second in any X, Y direction. It's about 50 millimeters per second vertically. Oh, wow. That's that's a lot of mass moving pretty quickly. And accurately. Yeah. Well, I, I looked at the algorithms of how they do that, and much like old moving head disk drives, um, I, I worked on the you know, giant washing machine size, big multiple platter disk drive. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. And I, I wrote software drivers to talk to them, so I had to calculate momentum and rotational speed. To know where the data was going to be, where the where's the cylinder, where's the head, where's the track, and in order to improve the performance, um, we goosed the voice coils that moved the head in and out. So we had control over the amplitude of the signal we used to engage the magnetic coil to start the head moving. And what we would do is we would say. How many cylinders do we need to move across the surface? If it was a large amount of cylinders, we would hit the magnetic coil with the highest possible voltage for a very brief period of time, and it would get that head, get that inertia, well, yeah, inertia. Stop, stop the zero motion inertia, and get it, wham, get it moving as fast as possible. And we had a curve where we would say, after this amount of time, and the time back then was in microseconds, um, nowadays you couldn't even do that because it would be nanoseconds. Um, the curve was such that when it got this far towards the cylinder, you would hit it with the reverse polarity uh -huh. near maximum voltage, like started slowing down. Yeah, and yeah. It would, actually, it would actually slow to a stop, and you would either be the cylinder before or the cylinder after. And you'd need one rotation to know if you were off by one, and then you'd step it in or step it out. It, it would literally take you from it being a 50 millisecond head move to being like a 20 millisecond head move. 
just because you ramped that head moving and then you smacked it to slow it down and then you jittered it at the end. Yeah, but this thing is running. Doesn't it get hot? You know, <laughs> with all. Yeah, these- when we were playing with the driver, we wanted to see how bad it could get. Yeah. So we started a program that would drive the head from cylinder zero to cylinder 306, yeah. just yeah. back and forth as fast as it could, and right. read one track of data at each side. Uh, we literally melted the wire yeah. in the coil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the and the repair engineer from the disc manufacturer came out and said, what have you guys been doing? Yeah. <laughs> we, were running, we were running a diagnostic to see if we could improve the shape curve of the magnetic pulse that we were generating to the head he goes don't ever do that again yeah i know exactly <laughs> why what not is yeah the coil can take that level of voltage for a second but it cannot take it for sustained seconds the copper wire will heat up to the point where it will melt off the polyurethane coating that keeps the coils separated and the coil will short itself oh now you tell us <laughs> yeah, I had to work on a uh, uh, a camera shutter, a real big one, like a yeah. eight inch shutter, and we had momentum. And oh, yeah. you have to worry about momentum of physical things. Getting it started, getting, and then slowing it down at the end, resetting it for the next exposure, mm-hmm. and sure enough, the, even the very lightweight, thin blades. Yeah, boy, they had inertia. Thin piece of blackened aluminum can wear weigh fractions of a gram and still have mass. Yeah. Different ways of coating that piece of metal mm-hmm. or changing its thickness. We and we had parameters we had to meet. Yeah, uh, eight hundredth of a second. You know, whatever. Uh, and uh, you, you couldn't coat it with a flat black because that would pick up heat. You had to well, coat it with a porous the metal. black. Yeah. Yeah, there's a way of treating the metal itself. Yeah, instead of coating it. Yeah, we started with painting it and all that. <laughs> but this thing had to go into an airplane at you know. 200 i can tell you (laughs) we we had special lenses built and all that stuff but the hardest thing was the shutter yeah because that had to be dead on accurate (laughs) and we had to, like you say goose it get it started before the 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 exposure had to be made so it's moving already yep and then yeah great fun great fun Uh, it kept us awake days and nights for a long time it's just the math yeah, we'd be out having a picnic or something, or all of a sudden the boss calls up, no, there's a problem here, get, it, get back in. Yeah. No no remote work. We had to go in and, and do that. Of course, the, of course. And measurements very fine. In those days, it was hard to get fine weights and measures. Mm-hmm. Uh, mechanical stuff was hard to do. Well, these guys that did the report in Nature Reports magazine, they were trying to measure not the wavelength of a photon, but how many photons were hitting something because they wanted to measure the mass of it. Because if you've got, you know, um, optical tweezers, you need to know how much force they can apply. Well, how much, you know, how much uh, biologic material can they move in the X-ray telescope, in the X-ray microscope? So they need to be able to measure the force of it. And that's why they went down this path of how do we measure the force of something that's Pico Newtons. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we can measure light. <laughs> yeah. How many uh, fairies can dance on the head of a pin? You know, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. nowadays, uh, with uh, X ray lithography, you can probably get a few billion fairies dancing on the head of a pin. <laughs> I never met one. <laughs> <laughs> I think they ought to do that someday. <laughs> I mean, it, would, it would cost millions of dollars to occupy the fab to do it, but I think they ought to take the head of a pin as a surface. You just, write up a paper etch, on it. Just etch little tiny images of fairies. <laughs> the like fairies. publicity for that. That would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> we, we found it. <laughs> yes. We, we've etched 400 million fairies on the head of this pen. Yeah, that's a lot. But, but they're all standing still. There's plenty of room. They weren't dancing. They don't, they don't weigh much. You yeah. know. And then what song do they dance to? You, know, you have to worry about that. <laughs> yes, but if you played the song the shock wave of the acoustic change will be so dramatic and we'll knock the fairies off the, off the pen. Yeah, right. <laughs> and what do they wear? I don't know what fairies wear. You know. <laughs> Obviously chiffon. Yeah. 
Okay. So that's how you measure photons and their wavelength. <laughs> yep. Until there's some other breakthrough that we don't even know about. Yeah. You'll never know how much you didn't know until you know what you didn't know. Well, the aliens will sh to show us. Aliens, they know. <laughs> well, I'm fading. I think I'm I, I was going to say, any night. more things for today? If not, I'll go ahead and stop recording. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs>